It's December 14th, 2020. This is Rook. Maybe of all the guests we've had on Rook so far, including famous authors, musicians, statesmen, journalists, artists, academics, politicians, no one has had an impact on as many people around the world as our guest today. That is, if you are one of the people who created the video game Grand Theft Auto, you have reached millions and millions of homes. Navid Khonsari is a distinguished Iranian-Canadian video game designer, virtual reality film and graphic novel creator, a writer, director, and producer. One of his most recent creations is close to his heart and his own personal lineage, the award-winning game 1979 Revolution Black Friday. Navid joins me to discuss that and his journey. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 70 of Rook. Hope you are spectacular wherever you are in the world listening to us right now. We are at rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, and we're on this ongoing mission to build a, a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We are coming to you on SoundCloud, on Instagram, on YouTube, on iTunes, Spotify, and Telegram. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hello, Gian. You got How are lots you? of love for your new series. <laughs> yeah. You did. Yes, you yes, did. yes. It's, it's called It's All Persian to Us with Keon Nademi, yes. also known as the fabulous Keon. Yes, just making sure it's the same person. It is the same person. <laughs> I know that. We will have a new installment of that uh, Thursday here on Rook. It must mm-hmm. have felt good. Yeah. 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 Are you looking forward to the next one? I, I, I'm not really interested in it, but I'm glad <laughs> that the audience. Is. I had a feeling you wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so no, I nice. think it's I think it's uh, it's it's great. I'm so excited that we've got you doing this. And so every Thursday, it's all Persian to us with Kian Nademi. And <laughs> why are you laughing? I, I, don't, I don't know. What's it's, wrong with I, him today? I, I still find it funny that <laughs> did the, you oh, have some mushrooms? Today? That it's, I did. Yes. And once again, I, dr- I <laughs> dropped some mushrooms. I ate some mushrooms. I injected some. <laughs> Coming up in a few minutes, uh, Navid Khonsari. He's He's like a rock star in the gaming world. I, I think he's our first guest who's won a BAFTA, which is the British equivalent of, a, of an Oscar. He grew up in Canada and Iran, has been in New York for the last two decades, and developed this game called 1979 Revolution Black Friday. Obviously, it's based on the 1979 revolution, and it's a Iranian revolution. It's, it's, it's part video game, part historical documentary, part ethical quiz, educational journey all in one. Really compelling stuff. Really interesting guy. I'm looking forward to uh, speaking to him in a few moments. Captain Reza, how are you? I'm very well, sir. How are you? Uh, the, well, the weekend was very nice. You know why? Why? I spent it with one of my favorite people in the whole world. Okay. Uh-huh. Oogie? That's right. My dog, Oogie. No. <laughs> I spent people, it with, like, actually, people. yes. That's basically my life with this damn dog. He's around me. I can't get, I can't shake him. You know, the dog always, like, wherever I go, there Aww. he is. Uh, no, I spent time with our dear groovy Shia, Shia oh, Jun. Nice. We were here till the wee hours. God love him. He was here in the studio with me for much of the weekend working on something special. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, there may have been some objo consumed. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And for the non-Persians, what would be objo? Uh, beer. <laughs> du bière, that's right. Uh, and... Uh, we searched for something uh, healthy to eat. On, <laughs> it was like midnight on Saturday. We're working here in the studio, and and, nice, nice. and so healthy Shia pulls it. out the app, you know, and he's <laughs> yeah. like, Uber Eats. Um, um, why, why don't we have some pizza? And I was like, Ah, oh, Shia, come on, we should, do, we should do, we, we we should have something healthy, you know, bro. Let's get. Oh, why don't we get some A and W? And I'm like, Shia, what, what about something? You know, let's get. How about? I mean, we're both, you know, healthier. Got to watch. Uh, yeah. So, so what do we end up getting? 
KFC. Oh, <laughs> we got no. a bucket yeah. of KFC. Oh, right. No. Yeah. That's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest mistake you can make. Such a mistake. Oh, but it was delicious. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it was delicious. It, it was delicious. But we were working on something special, and I want to announce it right now. So next week is Yalda and Christmas week. Uh, we're one week away from uh, from Yalda, actually, the mm-hmm. uh, Shabbat Yalda, the, the night of Yalda, and something very special on Rook. So so Yalda night, um, you want to explain what it is, Keon? It's the winter solstice, Winter correct? Winter yes, solstice, exactly. We, and we welcome this by getting together with family and friends and eating pomegranate, and what else do we do? Eat watermelon? Is that part of it? Oh, no. Joel. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's K- K- KFC. Lots of, it's Yalda night. It's KFC. And so it's the longest and the darkest night of yes. the year because uh, it's, you know, I so look forward to that December 22nd where we're on to, on the track to, to lighter days again, yeah, right? right? If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, if you're mm-hmm. listening to us in Australia right now, you're like, what are they, what are they talking about? And, uh, <laughs> That was terrible. What was that? I think I was. Like, I, I did someone from Wellington. What, what I was just like, happened? What were they talking about? Is he having it's a from stroke? New Zealand, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, next week is Yalda, and uh, on Monday, and then Friday is Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. Right? Wow. It's a big week. Big week in the Northern yeah. Hemisphere for Iranians and those of us in the diaspora who've celebrated Christmas since we were little kids. So for next week, we thought we'd do something very special. So what says Yalda more than Pink Floyd? (laughs) A lot of things. But we are doing a Pink Floyd special, a four-part, five-hour series called Why Pink Floyd and Iranian Obsession. We have uh, 15 guests lined up from around the world to discuss the disproportionate affection and connection between Iranians and the band Pink Floyd. And so this will be, and we're going to drop all four parts on Shabby Yalda on Monday night. It's like uh, it's like our version of Netflix. It's like our version of The Queen's Gambit, right? <laughs> our version of The Crown, yeah. Right. So the Why Pink Floyd and Iranian Obsession next week coming to you. Five hours, four parts, fifteen guests from around the world. Uh, that's what Shai and I were working on the music for and everything. But uh, uh, I mean, we got to do the interviews. But uh, we're very much. Looking forward to this. I'm excited. Me Can't too. wait. Yeah. Me too. It's more than just Pink Floyd, though. It's dissecting the cultural fabric of Iran somehow. Well <laughs> said, Kian Docht. It is. Uh, it is what we're figuring out. I mean, it's been weeks of kind of researching this, to be honest, to kind of first to determine whether the hypothesis is a legitimate one, that there is some disproportionate connection between Iranians and Pink Floyd, the iconic rock band from the 70s onward or late 60s to, to 1994 was their last album. Um, and there is that, that connection. And then to try and mine, try to excavate why that connection exists from everything from their lyrics to the type of music they play to the sonics of their production to what was happening culturally at the time when those albums were coming out to, for example, their legendary record, The Wall, coming out at exactly the time of the revolution in Iran. So all of these reasons teaming up together to to serve this this uh, reality that Pink Floyd had, has had this major impact on. Something that I suspect would be strange to a non-Iranian if you mm. sort of said, Guess what the biggest thing in you know <laughs> uh, for a lot of Iranian me. youths are you know if anybody from their twenties to their sixties who's uh, either in Iran or outside of Iran that's not to say that everybody of course is a, a Pink Floyd fan but this weird disproportionate connection so absolutely right Keon in the course of trying to discover that we're realizing that this is actually going to be something of a cultural journey why what happened what happened to music after the 1970s in Iran, that a band like Pink Floyd would become the thing that is passed down to people as opposed to anything else. Mm. Wow, yeah. fascinating. I, yeah. I, I really can't I'm wait I'm excited it. about it. I hope people will dig it. I hope they'll share it. I hope uh, this is the first time we've done something like dropping four episodes on, on one night, mm. uh, uh, as I say, Netflix style. But um, uh, Captain Reza, you liked that idea, really? right? Really, I really do like that Because my thought was we'll drop one every day. Yeah. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. But you said let's do it all no, at once. Let's, let's give the choice let's give let's, them the store let's give them the store yeah. let, let it's a little them. christmas present yeah I know. that's right that's that right is, that is spend true. your christmas listening to yalda i mean or yalda. Yeah, that's more true. gripping than uh than the queen's gambit 
I agree. More majestic than the crown. <laughs> Maybe. The suspense yeah. is killing yeah. me. Uh, while we were working on, the, uh, on Saturday night, uh, it was actually pretty late. I mean, it was at uh, 12 a.m. We were working on it, and uh, Oogie uh, was snoring, and it was very cute. And <laughs> yeah, and at, uh, at some point, <laughs> <laughs> at some point, <laughs> Zian told me, okay, buddy, uh, you uh, finished this editing. I have to write the introduction, and I said, okay, <laughs> sure. And I started to edit something, and it goes to 1 a.m., and... All of a sudden, <laughs> I, c I could hear Oogie's snoring Dolby surround. <laughs> some from here, some from there. Dolby <laughs> surround sound <laughs> snoring, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I came out and I saw Jian. On the studio floor. On the studio floor. <laughs> no way. Yeah, he passed out. Yeah, wow. He passed out there. And yeah, he was snoring. Oh yeah, that was God. immersed cute. in Floyd, so uh, you chicken <laughs> and beer, <laughs> yeah, so and, <laughs> and psychedelic music. I mean, what do you got? You know, what am I supposed to do? I really oh, can't wait so for this episode. So me and Ugi, yeah, I mean, I don't know what we created that night musically, but <laughs> hopefully something that'll be interesting for the special. Yeah. Um, <laughs> By the way, um, our last episode, we had Sarah Safadi mm -hmm. and quite a bit of reaction to her. People amazed at her her journey. This, uh, this engineer, this woman comes from Iran, becomes an engineer, and then makes it her quest to not only climb Everest, but the seven summits that all these you know, mountains on, on and, and it has six under her belt already. I know we got a lot of reaction to yeah, her. Yeah, we sure did, yeah. We got this guy who is so, I, I mean, I shouldn't say it was so Persian because there's people like this of every culture, but we're allowed to make fun of our own. Uh, the guy hits me up on Instagram, some, you know, I, I don't know, and he's like, uh, John, I, I really like your show, you know, thing. but this Sarah Safari, you know, and I was like, oh, what? What could you possibly come up with that is a diss, you know, to work? And he said, uh, no, I mean, it's impressive, but, you know, she has help. There's a team of people who do these this climbing. And it's like, what? really? What like, the really? Problem? The fact that, you mean, the fact that she didn't just go by herself with no <laughs> Sherpas and no own team and anything up the mountain, the fact that she had, it was just such a uh, an opportunity for, you know, like a, a reach. Let me find a way to bring this woman down. See, this who, is what's wrong with our culture. We can't just all support each other and uh, be happy for each other's success. But you know, but. she has had help going up those mountains. She has the... The oh, team no. of people and the guides, and then it's like, uh, listen, uh. next time you climb Everest <laughs> by yourself with no help. <laughs> so you've got some letters. Yeah, we have a lot for that. All right, we'll get to all of that. Thank you, uh, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Uh, let's get to our feature guest. You know, video games are often associated with fantasy, fiction, or outlandish actions. But what happens when a video game intercedes with history, factual storytelling, and ethical situations that are inextricably linked to a seismic historic event, like, say, the Iranian Revolution? Navid Khonsari is a distinguished Iranian-Canadian video game designer, a virtual reality film and graphic novel creator, as well as a writer, director, and producer. And one of his most recent creations is close to his heart and his own personal lineage. It is the award-winning game 1979 Revolution Black Friday. So Navid was born in Montreal, but his family returned to Iran almost right away, and he was raised in Iran until he was 10 years old and the revolution hit. He returned to a small town in Canada with his family in 1979. After graduating from the University of British Columbia and Vancouver Film School, Navid broke out into the video game industry and joined the company Rockstar Games in the year 2000. There, he became involved in the creation of some of the biggest, most successful, and most controversial video games of all time, including the Grand Theft Auto franchise. In 2006, together with his wife, Vasiliki, Navid co-founded Ink Stories, which is at the forefront of immersive experiences and has been featured in press outlets and award shows around the world. Known for having developed the cinematic look and feel for various iconic AAA franchises, Navid's celebrated original titles, 1979 Revolution, Hero VR, Fire Escape VR, and Blindfold VR, have earned him some of the industry's top honors, including 
including Best Game Direction and Independent Game of the Year nominations by the Academy of Interactive Sciences, a BAFTA, a winner of Facebook's Game of the Year, the New York Game Critics nomination for Writer and Best Narrative Game, and the Tribeca Film Festival's Storyscape Award. Navid Khansari guest lectures as a director for games and immersive experiences for classes at Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Duke, the White House, the White House, United Nations, Sundance and War. And right now, Navid Khansari joins me from New York City today. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? Uh, it's good to have you on the program. I mean, that's quite a resume you've built. You lecture at the White House. What? It, <laughs> not many people have that on their CV. What does that mean? So basically what happened uh, with that was I went down with a number of other uh, artists and creators to to talk to the DOJ uh, about what was taking place with uh, the approach that um, ISIS was having in terms of connecting with youth in America and around the world um, through their marketing campaigns and through Twitter uh, and primarily using video games as a way of trying to kind of break it down and they were trying to look at how do you kind of counter that. So the conversation was more of like, what is the element in their marketing campaign that's tied in with games and how could the White House, and this was, I should add, under the Obama administration. I was going to say, which administration yeah. was this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the whole idea was like, how can you actually counter the conversation where you can still engage with these young men and women who are feeling isolated, vulnerable in the West and are trying to connect with something of their own heritage and how to avoid the propaganda that was being pushed by ISIS and, and how to leverage kind of this interactive element to, to, to get them to have their own identity and not necessarily go down that path. And this was about, you know, five years ago. It's interesting. I guess when you're a celebrated or a successful video game creator, um, people assume that you have a portal into the minds of younger generations, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I mean, the funny thing is the average age for a gamer is now about 35, 36 years old. But I think specifically for this kind of uh, targeted audience, um, you get a pretty good understanding of uh, what, what, what they're excited about, what kind of gets them um, uh, into stories, how do they want to pursue a narrative. And more importantly, I think um, you're in this interesting stage of your life as you're kind of growing up where you are trying to find your own identity. And nothing is stronger than games by allowing you to be put in the shoes of another person and really make choices that are a reflection of how you think. So there's, there's an element of independence that you get uh, as a young person when you're playing games where you, you make choices and, and you deal with those uh, choices and the repercussions of it. That's true. It's kind of, it, it's a very honest way of looking in the mirror, the decisions you make in a video game. I haven't thought about that since I played Dungeons and Dragons as a, as a kid, <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. true, right? There's and, and they, there's usually moral or ethical elements involved too. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and you can see the change that's coming about in generations and you can see how that's being reflected in games uh, like 1979. I think 1979 would have had a much more difficult time if it was a decade ago than when it came out in 2016, because there's this interesting curiosity and also, quite honestly, exhaustion of the genres that are out there, which is I can only do so many shooters. I can only do so many kind of platformers. At some point, I'm interested in kind of a hybrid of story and these kind of games. And, and that's really kind of coming from the demand and, and, and the need from, from younger consumers who want to have something that's a little bit more reflective of themselves rather than just kind of like the previous alpha male teenage that, you know, the gaming industry was trying to appeal to, you know, through the 90s and early 2000s. Well, oh, having spent the last few days playing your game, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I would hope that uh, gamers or younger generations or, or, or everyone would be interested in this game. I'm curious if they are. Let me, so let me let, take you through this, or you take me through this. There, I mean, sure. first of all, there's so much to discuss with you and your impressive award-winning career, my friend. But I, I, I want to <laughs> focus on the story behind this game uh, sure. uh, that you've launched in the last couple of years, last few years called the 1979 Revolution, because I want to get into your personal story. Um, that is related to this. Obviously, you are Iranian. You were there. Uh, 
yep. when the revolution happened. Your family left then. Did you, first of all, I mean, did you have trepidation about taking on a subject as volatile and historically difficult as the Iranian revolution and turning that into a game? I did. I mean, it, there was always, I think, trepidation. I think more, more as a result of the fact that in the end, it's also a business and you want to make sure that you get a certain amount of success so that you can go on and do follow-up titles and follow-up kind of projects. So I think on, on the business side of it, trying to tell people that you're making a video game about the Iranian revolution and trying to get them to possibly show interest through investment uh, was certainly a, a challenge. But in terms of um, my own kind of like personal confidence, I think it was always there in the subject matter and in, in the medium that we were trying to kind of uh, convey it. I think we'd seen, I'd seen a number of films and documentaries, and I'd had endless conversations with, with my friends and my friends' kind of parents, you know, always talking about Iran and, and these, these, these mis- understood kind of conceptions of what Iran uh, was like and what it's like now. And I just felt a responsibility uh, to acknowledge what is the Iran of today, but also what was the Iran that I kind of grew up in so that people could kind of understand, uh, especially from the West, uh, the changes that have kind of come about, why some of those changes were deemed necessary, but also how advanced Iran was as a not a culture, but as a, as a society in the 70s in terms of um, what they were doing with technology, modernization, what they were doing culturally, women's rights, women in school, you know, uh, uh, the separation of, 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 of state and religion. I mean, all of these elements were there. But because we've become this Facebook generation, this generation uh, that looks at news and, 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 and just thinks about what's taken place in the past week, we so quickly forget what's taking place that most people that are living today only know Iran of either from the movie like 300 or from like what they've seen the on Argo. CNN or the <laughs> yeah. movie Argo, right, exactly, right. or what they've seen on CNN from 1980 on, assuming that every woman always wears a chador, right. every man has got a long beard and a turban and that we endlessly pray and all we want to see is death to America. And I just felt that that responsibility, if I could bring people in the shoes of another, of an Iranian, of an 18-year-old, of a photographer, and be able to actually not just tell the story, not just let them experience the story, but legitimize it with photography, with home movies, with elements that don't necessarily have to be political but are cultural, that it could start this kind of interesting kind of conversation. And so I always felt confident about that. I always felt confident that I could do it as a game, but I was never, ever 100% sure in terms of how it would be received by audiences, particularly in the West. I want to have that interesting conversation that you wanted to spawn about mm -hmm. in and around the game. But but first off, if you can do mm -hmm. this really briefly uh, for, folks, sure. for folks who are just listening and have never seen this game, I, it is an immersive experience. It's also an episodic kind of experience. Can you very briefly describe to someone, uh, give us the nutshell of what the, how, what the game is? Sure. Uh, 1979 is a choose your own adventure uh, verite game, verite being about the real world. You play as an 18-year-old young man who's come back to Tehran uh, the summer of 78, uh, just weeks before uh, Black Friday massacre. And um, everything has changed. And so you're kind of discovering and, and, and having conversations with your friends and with your cousins and with your family as the revolution is kind of s slowly kind of sweeping the country. The one thing you have is you're an aspiring photographer. So you're kind of also taking pictures and kind of documenting what takes place so that you can maybe share that later on. So it's really about your journey uh, the week before Black Friday up until the actual massacre of Black Friday. And it just is focused on the story of the people and you experiencing it as that rather than like the checkboxing, like these are all the historical elements that took place. Right. So you get to make choices, you get to take pictures, you get to engage and explore Tehran and you be able to you know, navigate your way through a riot. You'll be able to figure out whether or not you want to throw rocks or not. And then and it all kind of comes together with it being bookended with you in 1980, no longer being considered a, a hero or a participant of a revolution, 
but now you're considered to be a threat to the new regime. Right. And so you're being interrogated. So you have choices in the interrogation that has massive uh, repercussions for you and your family. And yeah, so that's really the focus. And all, of the long, the game. all along the way as a player, you have the choice. <laughs> Uh, how deep you want to go into the, the in, into learning about each one of these events? Like you have a, a every single time it, the, the game gives you the option to discover more and get a little historical recap of what what that moment or what that situation is about. Um, That's right. I, as I said, I played it a few times in recent days. You know, Navid. I mean, to be honest, I found it. Yeah. I found it really more educational than anything. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I would describe it as fun as much as fascinating. And so as a game creator, mm -hmm. um, and and I I can only imagine when gaming start, or video games started, the, the impetus was to create something fun. How important in the 21st century is it for a game to be fun? Or is that basically a stereotype about what gaming should be? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think games need to be entertaining and they need to be a engaging. I don't think they need to be fun in, in, in the way that people see it. Certainly, there's many games that can be fun, but you have to recognize that gaming has only been around since like the late 70s, early 80s, where you take a look at other mediums that have been able to kind of mature. This, this is very much still in its early stages. I consider 1979 kind of like one of the first steps towards marrying documentaries and games kind of uh, in one and one you take a look at the film industries documentaries came out over a hundred years ago we went through color sound all of these elements so gaming it, it yes it's meant to be fun for some types of games but look you've got other kinds of games where um it's not just about fun it's about it's a puzzle it's a strategy game right. Right. there's other elements where you're being kind of challenged in different ways so i think we're definitely trying to break that mold and saying look this might not necessarily be fun but just like a good TV series, a good mystery, it should keep you on the edge and wanting you to go more and more and further and further and deeper and deeper into the experience. And as long as we're engaging you, that is the big kind of checkout box for me. Gotcha. I do the, the New York Times crossword every day, and I think a lot mm. of people wouldn't consider that fun. <laughs> but, for, yeah. but, but, it, but it is certainly engaging for me. Uh, let, me let me come back to this game. Let, let's go back to, mm -hmm. uh, take me back to who you are. I mean, this, the story is that okay. you're born in Canada. Um, but you spent your early years in, in the seventies in Iran and mm -hmm. you were introduced to filmmaking and storytelling by your grandfather. Tell, tell yes. me about that. So, um, you know, I kind of exactly like you said, we went back to Iran. Uh, I come from a very large family on both of my mom and my father's side. Um, my, my mother's father, um, had been sent very early from Iran, actually to Germany in the thirties. Um, and as a result of that, he had lost his mom and his older brother to polio. So he was just by himself. And I think theater and film and all the stuff that was coming about uh, really kind of inspired him. So when he came back to Iran, he had come back with a Super 8 camera and was just kind of into not only documenting his family, but just actually making these small little films. And actually, when we were growing up in Iran, he had a small little 16 mil projector and we would watch some of the movies that he would have bought when he went to Germany or when he went abroad and brought back. And we just watch him on that. So for me, it was always um, interesting and kind of like looking at what the magician is doing behind his curtain when I saw him making it and then able to actually enjoy full on Western productions on his projector. So he had a huge influence. And I think, you know, that was him on the technical side. I would say my grandmother, uh, Asimaman, uh, she was the storyteller. She mm -hmm. was the oldest of seven women, sisters um, of like the Persian Turk kind of background. And from when I was a baby, she would just tell me these incredible fables and stories. And I was just in awe of it and inspired by it. And then I think, you know, I went through my own growing pains as a kid when we moved to Canada and, and then certainly in college trying to figure out what is it that I wanted to do and kind of came back full circle that you know, the, the, the influence and inspiration of my grandparents and what they did is actually the thing that I love the most. And mm. my parents have all were, were incredibly supportive and always said, you know, do the thing that makes you kind of happy. So I didn't go to film school until I was uh, 25. So, you know, that's kind of a little bit later than most. But 
that's kind of the path that I took. So it was, you know, it, it's 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 been an incredible journey since that. How would you describe those years, your childhood in the seventies? And you were in Tehran, were you? Yes, I, I grew up in I grew up in Tehran. I mean, it it was wonderful. Look, I mean, if you're an Iranian and you live in the diaspora, most likely. Um, you, you're not living in the same place with all your immediate family. Right. And, and, and that's what I had in Iran. I had a plethora of cousins. I had aunts. I had uncles. I had grandparents, all of them there. And, 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 and through that, I had these incredible childhood memories. I have two younger brothers. We're extremely close in our age. So there was always this incredible, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. I had the village in Iran. Many Iranians had that village there. And then when we came to Canada, that village became a family of five. You had another so, village. You, you moved to a village. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I moved to it. Yeah, exactly. So tell me about leaving Iran at, at the age of uh, 10 or in 79, mm -hmm. around that time. Could you process, I mean, you're, you're young, but you're not that young. Could you process mm -hmm. what was happening and why you guys had to leave? So, yeah, I mean, we, we did because um, what had taken place was we were coming up to 1980 um, and we were, my, my brothers and my, my, I was fortunate enough that my grandfather had taken me out to the streets during the early part of the revolution and was able to see kind of like the inspiration and the possibility of hope and change that could come about. By the time we'd hit the fall of 79, literally a few months before the U.S. hostage uh, crisis, you could see that things had changed, that the, the power had shifted. Anybody who was affiliated to the West, you know, my father was a doctor, was not politically involved at all. But there was like this witch hunt that was kind of taking place. And so that that little level of somberness, the, the number of executions that were taking in terms of like people who were politically opposed to the Islamic regime, um, it, it just was just building up to make Iran just not, uh, and Tehran in particular, not a place, quite honestly, my parents wanted to uh, raise three sons. And, and I think I, we understood that, and I understood that. And then I think, you know, we came to Christmas, we arrived in Canada the Christmas uh, of the first, uh, you know, the first Christmas that the hostages you know, had, in, uh, had in Tehran. And I think that uh, things were, couldn't be any more bleak in, in Iran. And I think it was a, we understood that, and we understood that it was a choice that our parents had to make. And we came to Canada and, and it was really, I mean, as a child, I think what you understand is things are going to change, but you cannot deny the fact that you can see, especially through my mom, the emotional impact it had for a woman who'd been raised in Iran her entire life, her entire fabric of her family is there. And now she's getting extracted from it and doesn't know what the future holds for her in a community and in a culture that she's knows of but isn't familiar and has really no ties to you you know uh you and i are, are of um similar vintage and and i've <laughs> i've made no secret about uh, my uh del daddy my 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 complaining about what it was not complaining but at least uh, you know excavating what how difficult it was to, to be pretty much isolated uh mm -hmm. ironically in thornhill ontario where there's now a lot of iranians but at the time when we when we fir first arrived in canada moved to thornhill uh when the revolution happened and i'm this kid and the the hostage crisis it was it was really 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 difficult Difficult um, in terms of the way people were seeing us and and the way we were targeted and and um, the only thing that I can imagine that would be worse than that would be to be in Barrie, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Ontario. Nothing against scenic, beautiful Barrie now, of course, but I, I happen to know that in 1979 that was a super white place. It's about an hour and a half or an hour north of Toronto for those listening wherever in the world and and, and may, may not know. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did your family move there? And what was it like for you to be there? Well, my father, being a doctor, was able to find an opening at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie. And we had had another physician that was a friend of my father who was based there. So you've got to understand, like, my father, his was like, all right, where can I get a job? Where can I go? And so Barrie was a good fit in terms of there was another family. We had to, you know, we didn't have a place to stay. We stayed with them. Um, and that's basically was the decision. Like, there's a job there. Let's go there. And then we arrived in Barrie. And you're absolutely right. Like when we when we arrived, the the, the diversity in, in, in Barrie was was quite limited. 
Um, and you know, like, like any place we had some people that were unbelievably kind and compassionate, but at the same time, when I was attending school, I had, you know, my brothers and I were continually dealing with things that kids would say because they were sitting in front of the TV the night before with yeah. their parents. And it said day 86 of the U S hostage crisis. And they would just regurgitate that stuff on the playground that would eventually lead. And I couldn't speak English that well. That would eventually lead to me going to the principal's office. And so, you know, those were kind of the, the, the issues that we, we had, but I also at the same time never backed away from kind of who I am or who I was or where I kind of came from. So I think in the time when people were trying to kind of bullying, bullying us, you know, I had two brothers who were, we were all close in age. We, we backed each other up and, and, you know, and, and we, we stood up for each other, but it, it, it was, it was a mixed bag where you also had people who, who recognized how, um, we stood out so much. And so they would help us and try to kind of understand how to navigate Canadian culture and, and, and how to navigate just being in this new environment. You end up going to, to school in, in BC and British Columbia, Canada, and then going yep. to Vancouver Film School. Mm -hmm. And um, you start your career in the film industry, documentaries in particular. Then you get involved in Rockstar Games, which is pretty much the holy grail of game development companies. Tell mm -hmm. me about how you end up there. So uh, I actually made a feature film in 96 in Toronto. And then after that, I went uh, and started just working on different kind of productions. And I came down to New York. I had some Canadian friends that were living down here. And I just kind of fell in love with the city. There was just, it just oozed with creativity. And um, it, was, it was just exciting. And so I decided to move down here. And I wound up meeting the head of development uh, at Rockstar Games. And we just kind of started talking. And they were in the process of... Uh, shooting Grand Theft Auto 3 and trying to figure out how that's going to go about. Uh, the two guys that kind of, the two brothers that head up Rockstar were, were looking to bring more of a s cinematic element of it. So it felt like it was, I might have been a good fit. I did a test shoot for them. They really liked the test shoot. And from there, I just kind of came on and finished up GTA 3 um, for them and then jumped and they liked that and then that led to Max Payne So I d jumped and did Max Payne as a director on the audio front and then we started working on the commercials So, you know a lot of the commercial stuff I was cutting so there was no production department it, at Rockstar Myself and a couple of colleagues basically spearheaded that and then that once GTA 3 kind of dropped everything just exploded yeah. and so we just ramped up and I was given the ability to expand the studio and all the things that I was familiar with from film, we started adapting uh, to the gaming model. Wow. You had the pedigree of being interested in film from your, your grandparents and storytelling. Mm -hmm. You went to film school. Mm -hmm. Were you into video games? Was that something that you had already become fond of or, or was this just an opportunity? No, I mean, you know, video games, movies, uh, television shows. These were the things that allowed me to, when I first moved to Canada, to connect to the other kids. You know, you might not be able to speak English very, very well, but if you say Chewbacca, everybody kind of knows who you're talking about, right. or Chewbacca. You know, and I think that that that, that was it. America, Canada. Um, I think their number one export is actually pop culture, and if you can speak pop culture, then that allows you to be able to kind of get over certain hurdles and and so for me video games was key played a lot with my brothers played with some friends and you know i did that um uh, from the 80s on certainly had some you know dips where i wasn't playing whether it was because i was in college or whether i was working but i always kind of uh was playing games i was always into animated films comic books so it, it, it was there as an interest the rockstar situation well, um, when I started with Grand Theft Auto 3, what was interesting about that was that I knew what they were doing on the gameplay side, but they had opened up the possibilities of what we could do cinematically, you know, bringing in real writers, really, you know, by the, by the time we were doing Grand Theft Auto Vice City, you know, I was directing guys like Dennis Hopper, Burt Reynolds, Luis Guzman, Jenna Jameson, Ray Liotta. I mean, so it was wow. just an incredible... Uh, process to be part of at, at what seemed like like the birth of this new approach towards games do you 
get frustrated sometimes that that video games and the the cinematic prowess that you bring to that may not get the recognition that you would get if you were making a a Scorsese film? Not really. To be honest with you, I feel like um, in the end, it's the output of my creativity. I don't necessarily look towards who's going to be acknowledging it or who's going to be giving me awards or tap, patting me on the back. And and what I'm, I've been able to kind of achieve, I, I would say, is on par with any kind of uh, hopeful prolific filmmaker who, who's been able to continually work in their craft. And And I think the challenges that exist sometimes in film is that there are it's it's hard other than like let's say Christopher Nolan to point your fingers to a Coppola to a Scorsese to these kind of guys because it's become more and more difficult for you to practice what you're doing and be allowed to make mistakes and not have it be career ending and having that pressure taken off of me I've been able to you know, create a game of, that puts you on the streets of Iran. I've been able to put you on the streets of Syria so you understand what it's like. I've been able to put you in, in Louisiana in, in Resident Evil and be able to do that. And I get to work with actors. We bring that same level of energy that we get that reward when, when the scene hits and it clicks. We know it's kind of there. And quite honestly, you know, most of my stuff is actually viewed by way more people than I would actually see my films. That's true. So... <laughs> You know, I mean, you take a look at GTA Five in its first um, in its first three days, it made over a billion dollars. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of eyeballs. So, in two thousand and six, you found Ink Stories in New York mm-hmm. with your wife. Yeah. And one of the areas you guys work in is is something you've as you've explained to us in this interview called Verite Games. This mm-hmm. is what you've described as a, a kind of mixture between video games and document the documentary form, uh, tr- telling true stories uh, in one way or another. Uh, tell me what the impetus for this genre was. What was the eureka moment that led to this? I think 1979, quite honestly, was the eureka moment because I had the idea for the project. What would it be like to make a game about the Iranian Revolution? You know, there's obviously an endless amount of conflict and turmoil that you can tap into that can create an interesting narrative. So I was like, all right, this is a great idea. Let's see who else has done this and be able to benefit from maybe some of the lessons that they've gone through. And that was where we were like, holy cow, nobody else has done this. And so that was the eureka moment. It's like, we're not just making a game. We're actually planting the seeds for a whole new genre in gaming. And I think that was also the exciting part of it. And how do we kind of bring that together? You know, my wife, who's also the partner of the studio, she comes from visual anthropology background. So it was a really perfect fit almost of our relationship personally to professionally be like, I came from a gaming kind of narrative background. She came from a visual anthropology documentary background. What would be the perfect child of this? And I think 1979 was that. So I think we were really excited about bringing, you know, establishing verite as the, an inch new genre in gaming i can only imagine it's a it's a tightrope to walk when you're when you're developing something like okay we're going to make a game about 1979 and the, the the black friday era uh because you don't want to make it so sophisticated or in the weeds as they would say that only scholars of the Iranian revolution or, or, or for that matter, Iranians could understand or play. And at the same time, if you dumb it down too much or make it so basic, you're undermining part of the um, precipitant for wanting to do this, which is to uh, provide a forum a, a new platform where people um, can learn about historical events or interact with them. It must be an interesting tight walk to walk. Uh, tell me about that. Sure. I mean, look, I think that um, if we had made it too scholarly, like you said, we would have we would have lost most of our audience. But the goal here wasn't to try to tell a historic story. The goal here was to tell the story of a people. And history books, I, I, that was what I majored in in college, history books very much tend to focus on the highlights of what took place. Who are the influential people that kind of sparked the change where that's not what we were interested in. And we wanted to tell the experience of the 34 million 
and 999,000 people that were living in Iran who were experiencing the revolution rather than the political figures that get continually, you know, be brought up by scholars in terms of what happened. So that was kind of the focus. Saying that collaboration with Iranian uh, American and Iranian European actors, Iranian American composers, really, and then an, an excessive amount of research, plus an endless amount of interviews from a spectrum that was from folks that were uh, ex members of the Two Day Party, people who were uh, from the, the from the you know Marxist, the intellectuals, the Islamic uh, students, uh, obviously the Shah supporters, and the people in that regime all the way to different socioeconomic groups that kind of were covered in this revolution. Those were the interviews that we did that really helped us out. And it was more importantly, the personal stories that came out of that. We wanted to make 1979 personal. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the personal allowed us to rock, you know, walk that fine line. On one side, we could appease the scholars because we had a plethora of experiences and exploration that you could do that could kind of show you what that world was. And at the same time, we can make it personal so that those who don't want a, a highly intellectualized experience can feel like it could be them and this could be the choices that they could make. And, you know, what's been amazing is is the number of the, the huge span of age that we have people playing it. You know, it's from 14 all the way up to like 65. Everyone's interested in these experiences. And I think that that's been the you know an interesting and rewarding part of it. Personally, having played it a few times, I I can't see how anyone would would come away from this game without having learned something as well as being immersed in the story. So, I, which I I really appreciate about this. I saw a couple of Navid. I saw a couple of Switch reviews of the game on YouTube. Um, one was very positive. Uh, in fact, the guy spoke about how this verite um, uh, genre is, is something that he's quite excited about, what you've done here. The, the, the other was a guy saying he doesn't come to games wanting to be taught about Iranian history and you know, he wants to be entertained. And, and uh, it, it was all too, a bit too much uh, on, on the, the storytelling side, if you will. What do you make of that latter response? Well, I, I think that I think he's if that's not what he wants to do, then that's not the kind of games that th that person should kind of play. Saying that by not making games like this, then we're actually denying the possibility of choice for these kinds of experiences. So the counters that a lot of people, you know, there's been a big talk about whether um, video games sh should be strictly entertainment and, and not be politicized. And, and I think that that's, that's, that's a bunch of baloney, quite honestly. It's like everything that we have in this world is politicized. And quite honestly, my counter argument is, is that when you have all these shooters where you're going in, especially, you know, like some of these military ones, where the main people that you're shooting down is people who are... Of, brown and black and asian kind of color right that is politicized we need to counter those arguments with something that is more authentic like in 1979 rather than just say well it's it, it's mindless entertainment so it doesn't make a difference who you kind of shoot you could have put shooting in this game. i mean you could have put car chases in this game you don't yep. it's 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 about moral decision making and sort of assessing options one might have in split second moments amidst revolution in the streets uh, tell me about the choice to not, I mean, clearly you know how to put car chases and shooting in video games, having worked on Grand Theft Auto. Tell me about mm -hmm. the decision to not do that. Well, the decision just seemed like uh, was just natural. It didn't seem uh, authentic because, you know, if you take a look at the 1979 revolution, interestingly enough, there wasn't that many weapons on the street. It was only when they actually broke into the military barricades that guns actually were put in the hands of the public. This was, uh, uh, and it would be demeaning the actual event by putting those things in it. Mm. In the end, I'm not. I look. I love car chases. I love shooting. I'm not. I'm not opposed to any of that kind of stuff. I, I enjoy being entertained. I like playing an entire plethora of different genres. But I think what we do here at Ink Stories and what we do as a team is we want to be as authentic to what took place. So in this particular scenario, it just didn't kind of fit in. And it wasn't right for the story that we wanted to kind of tell. There is shootings that obviously take place as you play the game towards the end and you have to make some gut-wrenching decisions. But that's actually being thrusted on you and the choices for you, how are you going to be able to survive it, who are you going to kind of save. So I think that was kind of uh, very, very important. Be authentic to the story. 
take a look at how that story can be best told. And quite honestly, we felt films and docs and all this kind of stuff had been exhausted and not necessarily had the impact. We thought game would be a great way. And so that's, you know, one thing led to another. And that was the best combination for 1979. You know, I was trying to be, as one is, if mm-hmm. you work in and around the Iranian community at this point, sensitive to whether there was any sort of um, ideological or political initiative around this game. And I, I oh. thought you walked, in fact, I, I don't even know how you did it, because you, you walked the line in a really savvy way politically. There's certainly no overt side taken. It, it, it all feels very nuanced. We're getting this taste of the Iranian people and culture during the revolution. How have Iranians responded to the game? I mean, you know, you would know if if you didn't already that the <laughs> when you put out a game like this, the Iranian community is highly fractured in terms of political opinions. The monarchists, the pro-regime folks, the communists, the mujahids, you mentioned a few of them in this interview. The, the topics you have chosen here, uh, the, the, the nature of this game is undoubtedly a risky one. Has there been political opposition from the diaspora toward making this game? You know, I, I think when when we initially went to, I thought the diaspora would be a great place to try to raise some money for this project. Um, those who have the deeper pockets come from a generation that have been extremely traumatized by the events of 1979. You know, no different than in terms of the impact that it, I was talking about my mom and my father when we moved to Canada. Um, so they were very, there's there's an apprehension in terms of what is somebody going to do? Because I think in the past, most content that's come about uh, Iran, the revolution has been quite polarized. Um, Whereas the younger generation and generation of Iranians who are coming from mixed families have not been able to understand the revolution because it's not being discussed. It's like this bad thing that happened and that's why we're here and that's it. And I felt like, and there's also people in Iran who are happy about the revolution? Are ha- there's there's a, there's a group who, who are happy, but at least some of the changes that have kind of come about, and I saw that. You know, I, I, I having gone back to Iran and having family members that cover the entire spectrum, I was able to get this feedback. And um, and when we were doing interviews, there were people who were very very you know outspoken about what what they liked and disliked on 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 either side. So. We just let that kind of come in, but I, I think in the end, for me, as, as the person who's kind of like directing the narrative and, and, and trying to tell the story, um, I, I saw all the different nuances, the challenges that exist when you've got all these people who have these polarized ideas or the ways that the country needs to be kind of led and how it should be led. There's no way that no one, you cannot criticize elements that took place during the Shah's regime but at the same time, there's no way that you cannot criticize also the same things about the Islamic regime. So if we basically just realize that there is different agendas taking place and we can be just view it and understand it, then I think we can kind of navigate and realize that it's it, it, politics is just a matter of different shirts kind of coming on at different time and the allegiances that people have. But to deny the Iranian diaspora the generations that have come out in the past two decades, three decades, the ability to actually engage with something that has had a fundamental impact on their life, on why they are a part of a diaspora, I think is doing a disservice. And so that is why, for example, in, in, in Iran, We've made sure that the game is there for free, even though when they banned the game, I was going to say, it out there. yeah, they did ban the game. Tell, tell me about yeah. that. The, the reaction of the, the the regime to this game. Well, I mean, it took literally two weeks since we released it, and anybody that was trying to purchase it, it within Iran got a big, huge red box that says this game is no longer, this game is not available. Supposedly, some some people were making copies of it and were trying to sell it in the bazaar. Those places got shut down. And then a press statement came out that said that 1979 is, um, it was done by the Iranian uh, chairman for computer games, saying that it was American propaganda created by me. I'm supposedly a spy. um, And that it's there to corrupt the souls of the youth which was like kind of interesting because if you take a look at it, like you said, like you had earlier mentioned, it's like 
there is definitely Islamic students who are speaking their mind about what is wrong and why they want to change. You have the ability to pray in uh, as a Muslim in, in this story. You have an understanding of all these different nuances. The graffiti that you can see is of the Shah made into a demon. There's, a, you know, there's a, a, an incredible amount of focus on making sure that all elements of every political kind of faction is discussed. So it was kind of strange for them to ban it. Of course, my counter was we immediately took the, the game, uh, translated it into Farsi, and then made sure that it was available to anybody in Iran for free through uh, uh, iOS stores in, in Malaysia and Turkey, where Iranians get some of their content through VPNs. And then we just put it out free online so that people could try to get it. And the feedback it was great from within Iran and outside of Iran. It was just a, a phenomenal kind of uh, strong, passionate response. Not that many haters. I think most of the haters kind of came in line with what you were talking about, which is like, I don't know why this is a, why I'm playing a game about Iran or why the, you know I'd rather just go and play Call of Duty or go play Mario. Which is, it, I'll take that all day. You know, in terms of that's the counter towards it. So. So that was it. And, you know, I haven't gone back to Iran since then um, as a result of this, which which is truly sad for somebody who I feel like I dedicated so much of my time to making this as a way to kind of honor what took place there on, on, on all sides and then to be wary of being able to return to a home country where you've done what you think is an, an homage to a chapter in their history. It's just kind of, you know, disconcerting. And, and, and at the end, sad. I have two daughters. I would do love nothing more than to be able to take them to uh, Iran and show them and my wife. But it doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. Is the game still banned? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's definitely still banned. <laughs> it is sad because, I mean, I, we, I've long passed the, the, the point of trying to um, figure out the trying to deconstruct the decision making around censorship and banning things uh, when it comes to this current Iranian government. But um, mm -hmm. but uh, it really is. I mean, compared to the myriad of material out there that would be um, that I could see the the regime taking issue with, it really isn't. I mean, it's a very interesting meditation on the revolution. Uh, but I, you know, I, I guess it involves, um, uh, I don't know, cool it's, hair, cool haircuts and outfits. And I, I don't know, I don't know what they're taking umbrage at, you know? Uh, but, yeah. but I do know that as you know, as well, that, that even in the diaspora, the, the, so many uh, political opinions are so baked in that I could see people, you know, from all kinds of p positions coming to this and, and, and saying, oh, this is a, a pro regime game or, oh, this is too hard on it. The, the Shah or whatever, uh, you know, and, and so uh, you can't, uh, so it's actually heartening to hear that you haven't had a lot of hate for it and that there's a lot of uh, interest in it as there should be, I think. Yeah, no, it's been, it's, it's been phenomenal. I mean, some of the responses I've gotten have been like real tear jerkers in terms of like fathers and mothers for the first time opening up to their children about what took place because they played the game together you know, it's just been, it's been a, a phenomenal, the, the impact of it has been, for me, hands down, the most rewarding element of, of this project. What did your family say, Navi? Um, well, you know, unfortunately, uh, my mom and dad both passed away before they were able to oh, see this game. So for me, it was, but at the same time, they're celebrated. I don't know if you got to see any of the home movies, but... You know, my mom is in there in the opening titles. Yes. She's swimming with her sisters at, at the Caspian Sea. She takes me the first day of school. So it's a celebration in many ways of my family. But my family in general was, was quite proud of it. You know, my brothers were obviously extremely excited. Uh, my, some of my family in Iran definitely said, don't come back anytime soon. <laughs> so <laughs> they threw that in there. But yeah, they were, they were pretty, they were pretty proud. I mean, there's a fair amount of me and my family in this project, you know, um, so, and that one thing that gets me excited about it is like living and having the content live in this digital world. It's something that 10 years from now, my, my kids can kind of go back and take a look at and have a totally different perspective than when they were like little babies 
when this project was being made or when they were 10 years old and they, and they saw the experience for the first time. Although some of the animation and cinematography, well, it would be like, oh my God, this is so 2016, you know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll think it looks like the Stone Age. Oh, I, for sure. Y- you know, one of the really, I'd be remiss if I don't mention this before we end up, but one of the really appealing traits of this game, honestly, uh, like off adding is that it actually employs Iranian actors and voices. You mentioned this a little earlier. Uh, you, you know, this has been a struggle for us in the West uh, where even films that depict Iranians ostensibly often cast mm-hmm. non-Iranians in those roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about uh, your approach to conscious casting. I think conscious casting is one of the most important things that one can do when creating a a story the authenticity that can kind of come from those who are through their dna through their life experiences through their religious beliefs connected to the story that's being told just pushes the story in a in a way that will there's just no doubting that it will resonate with audiences um the authenticity of it is is essential but the shorthand between the director and the actors to be able to get to that place is just unparalleled. You know, I don't need to tell somebody who comes from a Latin American background of this is what it was like in Iran, or you might find similarities within your culture so that you can play this Iranian. You know, it's not about having somebody speak a couple of lines of Farsi with some with a bad English accent and having the actor work on their accent. It's about somebody who has a grandparent, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle who has a similar kind of story and so that they can bring that to it. I think the fact that we're talking about conscious casting in 2020 as a result of the events that have taken place is is a little too late, uh, quite honestly. And I'm happy to see that we're now you know, really kind of focusing on it. Anybody who's making a movie about Iran, if they're not involving Iranian actors in it and they're saying well they're hard to find they're not working hard enough and they're not looking hard enough and in the end they're doing their project a disservice and i think that more and more people need to take that idea and that approach and make sure that it comes to fruition i can only say that this project while it might have been spearheaded by me is really um the result of iranian american European actors and composers, as I mentioned, you know, people, sound designers, sound mix people, animators, you know, concept artists, people who had to leave Iran because they were concerned about the implications it can have. All of these people have actually made the project. And what's really funny is the non-Iranian folks that we have in our staff that have kind of worked on this project, they, they consider themselves now like to be like almost part Iranian <laughs> because of the fact that they had delved so deeply into the history and the research that we did that many of them argue that they know it better than their own. So I think it's really, really, really kind of important and uh, and key to actually just making making great content. You know, I, I think about you making this game and all of what you've just said, and it's kind of a... Um, you're creating something, you've got this company. I mean, you're, you're not just a creator, you're an entrepreneur. I know that about you. So, so, uh, there's all of that, but this is also a journey into your own identity. Um, in the course of making this game and, um, the aftermath of it, I suppose, did you learn something about, about being Iranian or about your past or about who you are that you didn't know before? I don't know if it, it was something that I didn't know before. I think it was something that just kind of like materialized. And I would say, and I think it's this, it's, I grew up in Iran until I was 10 years old. I am 100% culturally Iranian. I try to pass on the culture to my, my children. And yet I'm very much from the West. I have become, I have been celebrated because of my understanding of, of Western culture you know, hip hop culture and games like Grand Theft Auto and so forth, or horror uh, movies for projects like Resident Evil or or whatever it is. And in the end, I've kind of figured out that I'm, if if, if you were to pinpoint it geographically, I'm not from the West, I'm not from Iran, I guess I fall somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, (laughs) because uh, on my own little island, because I have both of these influences, and I think in the past I've always kind of seen myself as 
Iranian and and then kind of like living in North America. And now I kind of see myself because when I go to Iran, when I was in Iran and I start speaking Farsi, people are like, <laughs> oh, I know you're speaking Farsi, but, you know, as you say, just, you know, like, where, what's your accent from? And I'm like, uh, well, I'm from, I'm from New York. And they're like, ah. And then when I'm over here, yeah. I find myself when I'm speaking English, sometimes I'm translating it from my mind, thinking of it, that, that sentence in Farsi. <laughs> and I get people asking me, well, where are you from? So I guess the thing that you come to realize that when you're a part of this diaspora, and what I learned in 1979 was that I'm kind of, we are this new mishmash of both, which is yeah. we want to show honor and respect and love when we love the culture. We certainly love the food. We love the bond of family. We love the bond of, of what it is to be Iranian. And then at the same time, we've also benefited from so much that the West has given us in terms of opportunity, in terms of being able to create a better life, in order to love music, in order to love art and film, and things that are different, not that that stuff doesn't exist in Iran. So I feel like we are this new hybrid uh, of, of citizens, of, of Iranian Canadians, Iranian Americans, even me, you know, I, I live, grew up in Canada, I've been living in New York for 20 years, that's now become part of it. So I think that's what's really kind of kind of floated to the top for me is realizing that I'm not from anywhere. Maybe I'm from the Atlantic Ocean because I'm a mixture of all of this Listen, stuff. Listen, uh, you're not alone I, I, in that on that little island somewhere in the Atlantic. I mm -hmm. think there's a there's a few of us populating that. Uh, uh, call us the the Nowarians or whatever. Your your <laughs> life is a um, is a verite game of its own. And Absolutely. before I let you go, let me ask you about this genre because uh, it can only be informing the the work that we can expect from you in the future. Um, I'll just ask it directly. I mean, are yeah. Verite games economically profitable? The entrepreneur side of Navid can answer this question. As, as the guy involved in Grand Theft Auto games in the past, it, it almost feels like a filmmaker going from the Avengers to Art House Fair, you know? Mm -hmm. It's certainly laudable, but can more Verite or informational type games help you keep the company lights on? Absolutely. I mean, look, our next project is going to be about... Um, the East German Stasi, uh, the secret police, and, and being able to um, show the similarities that it has with what's taking place with surveillance and, and data breaching and, and your own personal data and how we can kind of make those parallels. Dude, you can't you can't do a rom com, can't you? You, you, can't, you can't just do like a sitcom or something. Like it's no, like the I Stasi, think, Syria, the revolution. Yeah. You know. Well, you know the whole funny thing is, I I always have thought that the holy grail of games is actually comedy. You know, to be able to nail down comedy through interactivity is right. just going to be top notch. But I think <laughs> you're I think off to a good start. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think to 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 be to be honest with you, it's like. We, we, we mix and match, right? Like we've got some stuff that's very much kind of in, in line and we have in development a project called Rotten Bone, which is, you know, very much like a, an all-female chain game kind of um, game that you can play, a multiplayer aspect of it. We've got the Stasi project, as I kind of mentioned. Um, you know, we're working with some larger, very large partners in terms of helping them in, the, in terms of their design. So, we look this is the early stages of any kind of genre is it what you know if somebody came up to me and said is it going to make mario money it's not going to make mario money will it keep the lights on 1979 has now been downloaded over a million times wow. you know it got facebook game again it went with facebook game of the year and then on the other side it's one indicate so it's it, it has the ability to kind of do so um but I think, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm in this for the long run. The long run is that if we make more and more of these, we will start creating a new breed of creators that might find this enjoyment, and they will do it. And we can pass these lessons that we've learned onto them, the template that we've learned, so that when somebody says, hey, I want to do a video game about the Ukrainian revolution, they can then look at 1979 and say, hey, look what these guys kind of did. So it's not necessarily about... We, I need to keep the lights on, but for these projects, it's about finding success in multiple different areas and certainly validating it in the end financially, but not needing to make that billion dollars because, quite honestly, we don't need to. Our budgets don't need to be that big in order to kind of pull that in. And look, in the end, it, it, it fills a cup. It fills a cup. Um, 
when you're making video games, I don't know how many people can feel like they're actually having a positive impact mm. on the world, on the culture, on the society that they uh, are a part of. And I, and I hope that that's kind of part of what we're doing. And I feel that um, younger designers, younger creators and generations to come are actually prioritizing that far more both as audiences and as creators. So I do feel, you know, I always tell my brother Ali and Ramin one thing, I'm like, success is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. Hmm. So that, and I truly believe in that. And I think that that's the, the motto that we carry for, for our Verite games. It's good to talk to you, Navi. The kid from Barrie, Ontario has done well for himself. <laughs> uh, Thank keep, you very much. Keep it up and, and keep in touch. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for doing this today. Absolutely. Take care. Chodafis. Chodafis. Navid Khansari. He's the co-founder of the company Ink Stories. He's a virtual reality film and graphic novel creator, writer, director, producer. He's the man behind the video game 1979 Revolution, Black Friday. Navid joined us from New York City today. here with Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. You're listening to Rook, coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, the Telegram. Uh, see, there's a guy. Mm. That There's a guy doing really interesting work. Yeah. He's parlayed his talents into doing amazing work and now tying in his lineage too. I, I loved that conversation. I really enjoyed talking yes, to him. Yes. Who knew the one of the creators behind one of the most successful video games in the world was Iranian. I mean, I, I have memories playing Grand Theft Auto with my brother, so it's it's really cool to see. Right. You know, I'm, I'm like yeah. fangirling a little bit. Well, you should, uh, this Black Friday 1979 Revolution game, uh, you, you should buy it. I've Support never heard him. of it. It's interesting. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to look into good. it. Yeah. And, and the idea that people were trying to access it in Iran and they couldn't and the whole, you wow. know, it's... it's yeah. uh, um, Unfortunately, I'm not into game playing and I wasn't into game playing, but I've heard about GTA and also I've heard about the Black Friday. And You uh, know, as someone who uh, I would not say I'm gr great at, you know, in terms of uh, as a video game connoisseur, but uh, it's not a difficult game to play. It really, you, you know, if you get this, if you want to try this 1979 revolution, it's, it's like it, it is more interesting than it is technically difficult to play. Uh -huh. you're, you're learning, you're making ethical decisions. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting too, like the, the different characters, you know, putting you in uh, Iran of the late 1970s. It's, it's worth checking out. Yeah, f uh, I only played FIFA and GTA. I was never a gamer, yeah, really. Same here. But FIFA and GTA, I was super into. And when I found out this guy like created, it was one of the creators of GTA. Yeah. Um, I feel proud. I'm really like this. You know what's funny? 1979, like aesthetically speaking, the look of it, yeah. cinematically, yeah. it looks very. So like it reminds me of the GTA. Yeah. Right? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, it reminds me of Tehran. But well, it does yeah, 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 yeah. Completely. But, uh, but I, like the aesthetic of it is like you. Uh, and when I found out that this guy was, he was behind. Uh, um, that he was one of the creators of uh, Grand Theft Auto. Mm -hmm. Is you can tell, you can connect the dots. But you know, it's kind of like we just brought a an amazing musician on, and we're talking about his his his, his song from twenty <laughs> years ago. <laughs> the guy's true. doing amazing That's stuff true. now. That's true. You know, and uh, especially by working in documentary and ethical situations and video games about important events that are happening around the world. Um, that, uh, yes, GTA. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, let's yeah. respect him for what he's doing more recently, too. The guy's like, they just talked about my hit song, you know, after an hour-long interview. That's no, all but, we talked about. But really, good for him for integrating his own culture into his yeah. craft. Yes. That, I, I have respect for that. It is Monday. Mm -hmm. It is the team has gathered. That can only mean one thing. Letters of the week. All right. So last week on episode 69, we had an interview with mountain climber Sara Safari, who's on a quest to be the first Iranian in history to climb the seven summits with only one left, Everest. 
which she had to postpone after attempting it back in 2015 after being hit by a sudden earthquake and avalanche while climbing halfway up the mountain. Yes. And it was it was an intense episode. Whew, getting shivers just reading that. Yeah, I thought I was the only one who got anxiety no. while I was interviewing her. <laughs> I was Then shivering. we get these letters from people saying yeah. that, they, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So on YouTube, we have, uh, as the name is listed as N, last name Agoyan, said, I'm so proud to be Iranian. Not only, but mostly because Iranian women like Sara. Great interview. As always, thank you, Rook team. And then we have Raha Shabani wrote, I really like your interviews. Thanks to you and your great team. I really admire Sara and Azim Qaychizos. As well, she's an Iranian mountain climber who's climbed all 14 8,000ers. Mm. Interesting. And then we have on Facebook, Nazila Rafizadeh wrote, I couldn't breathe during that interview. It was like a thriller movie. My heart was beating so fast. Sara is so amazing. Yeah. I agree. And yeah, and then moving on to Instagram, we have username Samira Arya, but it was written by Samira and Homayun. I'm assuming that's her husband or a significant other. Uh, they both wrote, definitely one of our top 10 most engaging interviews of Rook podcast so far. We found Sara to be very down to earth with a beautiful soul to compliment it. We just want to wish her many more journeys with many more Everest peaks to climb to. <laughs> Many more ever yeah, speaks. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm with her parents. I'm like, to give us it. Like, I, enough already. You did your climbing. We loved having you on the show. You're an inspiration. Do you get, why throw yourself back up that mountain? I don't want to hear that story anymore. Like, I know, I know. Anxiety. I know. But she'll always feel unfulfilled. So good for her. I want her to pursue it. I think she needs to in her life. Right. And then we move on to a Samira Talebi wrote, I was in the middle of the Tochal mountain in Tehran when I decided to listen to your new episode and interestingly find out that this conversation is about mountain climbing. By the way, Tochal mountain's height is 13,000 feet, which is only half of Everest. Also, thank you so much for the It's All Persian to Us segment. Mm. I Thank can't believe you, that's. Samira. I can't believe that's not the letter of the week. <laughs> Honestly, so it was good. close. It was really good. It was cool. She's, Samira is in Tehran mm -hmm. on a mountain, listening to this about a mountain climber. I think yeah. that's that's uh, brilliant. Yeah, this came second. For Keon, Lord. shame on you. I know. Shame just on wait. you for not making. Just wait. The letter of the week. This Samira week Tal. Uh, what's her last name? Uh, Talibi. Samira Talibi, you have my letter. Of the week. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sending my love to you in Tehran. <laughs> just wait for it. Oh, okay. all right. Anyway, so uh, so for anyone that missed uh, that same episode episode 69 we had the inaugural installment of it's all persian to us with yours truly yes where i take the listeners on a journey for all things persian so on the first segment of last all things that are legitimately discovered legitimately by Persians, persian, not, not just things we claim that's exactly right, that's, right. that's right uh so on the first segment last thursday i talked about how the first development of a postal system actually comes from ancient persia in mm -hmm. case anybody didn't know that mm -hmm. so we have a hoda last name G-H, wrote, Chapar means career, messenger, or mailman, a.k.a. Nome Rasan. And uh, that's essentially saying the messenger in Farsi is Chapar, which literally translates to four legs. Because back then, that's, you know, they rid, rid on horseback. Mm -hmm. And then we have a Mojgan Big Delo wrote, Bravo, Kianjan, for adding a new segment to the Amazing Rook Show. Introducing Persian innovations is great, and the list will be very long. Well done. Thank you, Mojgan. What if it's not that long? What if, it, <laughs> it's like, what if it's like we get to number four and then Kian's like, I, I can't find anything else we discovered. <laughs> oh, trust me, it's very <laughs> long. It's presumptive Some statement. of the most... And then this is very long. How do you know? <laughs> Some of the most benign items that you wouldn't even think was know, has I Persian know, roots. Don't get all... <laughs> ethnic nationalism you know like all freaked oh, no. out it's okay yeah I agree there's going to be lots of things all we right. discovered all right. well, as well last week on episode 68 we had an interview with acclaimed Iranian German cinematic artist Ali Samadi Ahadi yes he's the film director producer visual effects supervisor known for his hit comedy films like Salami Aleikum and 45 Minutes to Ramallah as well as award winning documentaries Lost Children and The Green Wave it's a film focused on the green movement in Iran. Right. So uh, Ali as well has been uh, bravely battling advanced leukemia while continuing to work as much as he can on new films and projects, yes. which um, but we really, we, we, we appreciate his time. 
So on YouTube, we have a Matty Bish wrote, great guest and interview. By the way, as an immigrant who struggles daily to find the correct English word for different things, it's my guilty pleasure to see you guys struggling with the same thing in Persian. <laughs> Thanks, Matty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. doesn't like that. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Cool. And then I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> on Facebook, we have Shahram Mafi wrote, You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, smarter than you think. Thank you for giving us your perspective on life. Be happy for this moment. This moment is your life. And that's a quote by Omar Khayyam, the a famous poet. And he says, Thank you, Jian and the Rook team, for everything you do. That's lovely. Thank, Thank you, you Shahram. Shahram. Why, um, why isn't that the letter of the day? Just wait for it. Oh, I have the letter wow. of the week right here. Uh, yes. Letter of the week, sorry, yeah. <laughs> a little excitement, please. Oh, letter of the week. Oh, yeah. And might I just add that this letter might just be my all-time favorite. It might just go down as the Letter of the Week Hall of Famer. I enjoyed oh. it so much. It was like a little treat. The Letter of the Week Hall oh. of Fame. It's a yes. new thing we have to develop <laughs> on our, <laughs> <laughs> our website. With Kian Do, <laughs> the, <laughs> Ponta the Artist is like, no, not something new on the website. <laughs> I just figured out the episodes. Oh, right, this yeah. one, this Letter of the Week goes out to Farhud, last name listed as SM. He mm -hmm. wrote to us on YouTube. He wrote, well, well, well. Looks like if Keon talks one more time about bodily functions, I'll win Rook Bingo. In brackets, he has, my bet's on poop next time. Right. Just wait for it, Farhood. You might just get what you wish for. <laughs> and then he says, three quick notes. One, Captain Reza, way to earn your keep by suggesting to call Chef Host last week. Yes. Ooh, Good yes, job. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> and then two, why doesn't Shaya have a weekly segment called Shehre Shaya, where you compose a little something something and recite a poem? Maybe start with a Saudi poem at the UN entrance. Mm. Got oh. that, Shaya? Write that down. Shit, uh, Shaya. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait. And then what? <laughs> and then he adds that, and then he says, you can't just get high and eat barley pole all day. You got that, Shaya? <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's calling I think, I think it's lubia pole. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. It was a mistake on his <laughs> how, part. How dare you insult Shaya by... He's not getting high and eating barley pole. He's getting high and eating lubia pole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're up next, Gian. Oh, you're okay. number three. Okay. Three, Gian. I left pork early and went looking for panira tabriz. Mm -hmm and had to settle for, for Bulgari cheese mm. with noon sangak, asal, kha and khame. Mm. I got home around three and I've been eating a balanced diet of Persian <laughs> breakfast for two hours. <laughs> Chai shirini and all. Now on to the episode. What is this letter? What's going on with <laughs> yeah. this guy? Just it's wait. Like he's, he's <laughs> it's like a week composing this It's like thing. a novella. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then all he right. says, now on to the episode. One of my favorites. Sadly, I don't know anything about Ali Samedi Ahadi, and that's why I listened. I'm going to devour his filmography first chance I get. Good. And I have to say, there's a quirk in Ali's speech pattern, pitch, and tone to his voice. That slight German accent personifies a life lived wisely. I'll watch his films to get to know him better. That's really nice. That's a... That's a uh, I'm glad that you're going to watch Ali's films. Uh, that was a great letter. Thank I you, really Fadabud. Thank you to everybody who's written in. Thank you for the letter of the day, uh, 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 letter of the week work there, Keon. Um, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. We'll see you Thursday. This is full time for Rook for today. Our website, the hub of all things Rook, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, where you can see the letter of the week Hall of Fame <laughs> once we build it. But in the meantime, you can see all of our episodes. Uh, everything you want to know about Rook is there, and including our patrons page. And we'd love you to support us there if you can. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Uh, producer Susan Ponce of the Artist, Thoughtful Niggy, and the fabulous Keon Savvy, Roham Aray Merdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And as ever, please heed these words. Mizumbashim. <laughs>